is where I want to pick up. Chapter Chapter 19. What page are you on? In mine, it's 195. Yeah, I know. They, some of them have the same covers, but I don't think it's quite the same pagination. It's this one. Okay. It's the first page. <laughs> I'll just say that. <clears throat> Among the tales of sorrow and of ruin that come down to us, uh, from the darkness of those days that are there are yet some in which amid weeping there is joy and under the shadow of death light that endures again it's like language right out of the fairy story essay where Tolkien says you know that on callow lumpish youth sorrow peril and the shadow of death can bestow dignity and several other things okay of these histories most fair, still in the ears of the elves, of the tale of Baron and Luthien, of their lives was made by Lay of Lathian, blah, 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 blah. Okay? Um, and then there's a bunch of background kind of stuff that I'm going to skip. And we have Baron kicked out of his homeland, and essentially, uh, essentially, and he wanders around until several pages end. About seven pages or so. Um, no, I take that back. Sorry, I went too far. Uh, about five pages. Baron somehow, and we're never really told how, is able to make his way into the defended realm of Goriath. Okay, and I say it's defended because Thingol, the elf, in Melian, the Maya, his wife, lived there, and she has woven, we're told, this shroud of secrecy around it. And it's supposed to stop anybody from getting in, but apparently it's got a barren-sized hole, so to speak, okay, so that he can get through. And we're told that he stumbles his way in, and he's bowed as with many years of woe, so great had been the torment of the road, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. And he gets there, and right in the middle of that paragraph that begins with, it is told in the lay of Lathian, the Baron came stumbling into Dariath. We're told, um, wandering in the summer in the woods of Neldoreth, he came upon Luthia, daughter of Thingol and Melian, at a time of evening under moonrise, as she danced upon the unfading grass in the glade before Esgalduin. Then all memory of his pain departed from him, and he fell into an enchantment. Why does he fall into an enchantment? What has he just witnessed? Think of the fairy story essay. Is she forming like a ceremony in nature? No, she's just out there dancing. She's a flower child. She's just out there singing like some <laughs> hippie in love with the woods. Well, her mother was just in her mere presence powerful enough to make Elway stop hold for a couple of centuries, if she inherited any of this, surely just her mere presence would be enough to knock a mortal off his face. Okay, yeah, that's true. Well, it's something he's never seen before, someone dancing. I mean, well, her it's, particularly did happen. It's a fairian drama. In other words, he is seeing an elf, an elf maiden, actually an elf slash goddess, I mean, dad's an elf, mom's a goddess, essentially. Um, he is seeing her sing and dance, and we're told he's enchanted. Okay, That's the exact same word Tolkien uses in the fairy story essay to describe what happens to someone who sees a fairy in drama. They are enchanted. They take what they see as being completely, totally, 100% real. Now, the difference being, obviously, with us, we don't live in this world. Or at least not anymore, we don't live in this world. Okay? This is our world. Arda is Earth. Everything that happens in the Lord of the Rings does happen on this planet. It's just a long, long, long time ago. Okay. So, 
He falls in, into an enchantment because we're told Luthien was the most beautiful of all the children of Iluvatar. And we get to the description of her hair and eyes and all that kind of stuff. She vanishes from his sight. He loses his speech. Okay. And he just kind of wanders around in the woods for a while. But she comes back. And Luthien dances again upon a green hill, and suddenly she begins to sing. Keen, heart-piercing was her song. It's the song of the lark that rises from the gates of night and pours its voice among the dying stars, seeing the sun behind the walls of the world. And the song of Luthien released the bonds of winter. The frozen water spoke. Flowers sprang forth, and the spell breaks. So the spell on Baron is like the coming of winter. Just as winter freezes up the water, it freezes up the land, okay? The first coming of Luthien to Baron freezes his mouth, freezes his tongue. The second coming of Luthien takes the spell off of him. And he calls to her. She halts in wonder. They look at each other. It's kind of like love at first sight. Okay? And we're told in the next page, or possibly the same page in yours, that Baron isn't the only one that loves her. Daron the minstrel. In other words, someone whose power is in his tongue. Okay? Baron first sees her, he gets tongue-tied. He you know, can't say anything. Darren is someone whose who's ability is, entitled, is entirely in his tongue. He falls in love with her, okay? And he sees Baron and Luthien out in the woods. And so he goes and tells Thingol. So Baron is brought to Thingol. And the king asks him, Who are you that come hither as a thief and unbidden dare to approach my throne. All right? Come as a thief, Baron. Doesn't say anything. So Luthien stands up for him. Luthien stands, really I think it's safe to say, in front of him, protecting him. And she says, he's Baron, son of Barry here, Lord of Man, mighty foe of Morgoth, the tale of whose deeds has become a song even among the elves. All right? That's her way of saying, don't belittle him because we even sing songs of his father. Okay? Thingol, let Baron speak. If he's so mighty, he can speak for himself. What would you hear, unhappy mortal? The word would, we use it entirely only as what's called a modal auxiliary. It helps us form other tenses, you know, present, uh, future tense of the verb and such, okay? Tolkien's using it in its old Anglo-Saxon meaning, meaning wish or desire, and here it's past tense. So, what desired you? What wished you? What did you want here, mortal? And for what cause have you left your own land to enter this, which is forbidden to such as you? Now, if I were Baron, I would take up the second part first and say, I didn't know it was forbidden. I didn't see a forbidden to Baron sign. It didn't stop me from coming in. So he says, my fate led me here. Well, the elves understand something about fate. And through such peril, and through peril such as even, few even of the elves would dare. He speaks, if you're familiar with Lord of the Rings, he speaks like another character in Lord of the Rings whose name starts with B. Boromir. When Boromir gets to Elrond's house, he brags about how far he's gone to get there. And then Aragorn stands up and says, Psh, sit down, kid. You know, you don't you don't know distance. I've been all the way, you know, he talks about having, you know, essentially circumnavigated the globe. Okay? <clears throat> so he says. And here I found what I sought not indeed, but finding I would possess forever. For it is above all gold and silver, beyond all jewels, neither rock nor steel, nor the fires of Morgoth, nor all the powers of the elf, king, elf kingdoms shall keep from me the treasure that I desire. 
What does that kind of sound like? Like Sounds a little bit like Feanor. Sounds like an oath. Like he's swearing something. Neither, you know, this nor that nor this nor that is going to stop me from getting what I want. And she's right there. For Luthien, your daughter is the fairest of all the children of the world. Okay, think all smart enough to know that what he means is, I want Luthien and nothing will stop me. Everyone kind of goes, oops, <laughs> parents are dead, man. Shouldn't have said that. But Thingol speaks slowly. Why? <clears throat> Is it because they're getting into oath talk? Like they're getting almost to the... Partially. They want to make sure that he's clear on what the terms are going to be. They're going to make sure terms of negotiation, or et cetera, are very clear. That's part of it. Did he promise not to kill him? Okay. What was that? Did he promise... His daughter not to not to kill him or imprison him. Um. Yeah, he swore an oath to her that he would neither slay bear nor imprison him. Have you ever been so angry before that you really had to bite your tongue and make sure that what you said you said very slowly and very clearly? So that it was heard. Rather than just yelling at the top of your lungs. In which case nobody's going to pay any attention to you. That I think is what's going on. I think Thingol is so stunned. So amazed. And full of anger. That this mere human. Would think. That he, Thingol, is going to allow him, the mere human, to marry his daughter. Death you have earned with these words. And death you should find suddenly, had I not sworn an oath in haste. In other words, if I hadn't sworn to my daughter that you'd be safe, you'd be dead now. Of which I repent, base born mortal. Well, what does that tell us about Fingalian attitudes towards humans? You have the same problems in Middle-earth as you have in Harry Potter's Earth, as you have in our Earth. Problems of racism. That's exactly what this is. We're elves. We're the high and mighty. We live forever. We're better looking than humans, which they are. We're taller than humans, which generally they are. Okay. We're wiser than you. We have better voices than you. We can shoot bows and arrows better than you. We do everything better than you, and you die. You don't. Okay? That's why he calls them baseborn mortal. Who in the realm of Morgoth has learned to creep in secret as his spies and thralls. Oh, more guilt by association. He's essentially saying, you come from the realm of Morgoth like a spy or thrall, like a spy or a slave. Which, which of it are you, Baron? Ah, finally he speaks. Or speaks more, I should say. Death you can give me earned or unearned. In other words, you can kill me, whether I've earned it or not. But the names I will not take from you of baseball nor spy, nor thrall. In other words, them's fighting words. By the ring of Felagund that he gave to bear here, and we didn't talk about Felagund, but you've read the story, so you know what he's talking about. That he gave to bear here my father on the battlefield of the north, my house has not earned such names from any elf, be he king or no. Well, who is Felagund? Glendriel's uh, brother, son of... Um, Big dude, in other words. Yeah. Powerful, important. You could you could make the claim, I think, of a more kingly line than Thingol. After all, what has Thingol never seen? Actually, he has. They brought him over. They, they brought the three of them over, and then they brought him back so they... That's right. That's right. 
but he didn't stay. No. Okay. So Thingol hasn't hasn't really partaken of the blessed realm. No, he went there on vacation for a week. Yeah, exactly. Kind of like Paptosoma went off to the reservation and came back. Okay. <laughs> so he hasn't experienced life among the blessed, the Valar, the way Felagun did, okay, or Fenarf, or Galadriel, or... <laughs> and Felagun, he, like, sacrificed himself to Sauron um, so that uh, somebody, I think it was Bayor or Barrier or somebody, so that's... Self-sacrificed, okay? Keep, keep that in mind, you know, you... Um, or no, he does that later. If you get um, a version of this that is illustrated, I ought to bring this in one day. Um, version illustrated by Ted Naismith. Okay, Ted Naismith is a fantastic Tolkien um, illustrator, and I think he's got as one of his illustrations is the image. I'm pretty sure it's Felagan. A Felagan chained to the rock. You know, it's the old. Um, it's not pro Prometheus. Where is it, Prometheus? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of chained. Yeah, it's chained to the rock and has his liver eaten out, you know. It grows back and the eagle comes and eats it again. It's essentially that image. And it's a pretty good image, okay? And so when he swears by Felican's name, he's like, um, up me that name. Come on, let's, let's do this one upping. Let's see you try to one up that, okay? And when he swears by the ring, what does he mean? Yeah, this ring, okay? His words were proud, all eyes looked upon the ring, for he held it out off. The green jewels gleamed there that the Noldor had devised in Valinor. For this ring was like to twin serpents, whose eyes were emeralds, their heads met beneath a crown of golden flowers that the one upheld and the other devoured. That was the badge of Fenarfin in his house. Then Melian leaned into Thingol's side, and does what, essentially? Smart woman here. Smart wife. She says don't accept the challenge. For not by you shall Baron be slain. And far and free does his fate take, does his fate lead him in the end. Yet it is wound with yours. All of that is prologue to what she's really telling him. Take heed. In other words, she tells her husband, be careful. You're on thin ice here. Okay? Thing all looked in silence upon Luthien, and we're told he thinks in his heart. He doesn't say this. Unhappy men, children of little lords and brief kings, shall such as these lay hands on you and yet live? Well, I think it's probably safe to say that by this time, they already have laid hands on Luthien. And then he says, I see the ring, son of Bear here. I perceive that you are proud and deem yourself mighty. You deem yourself mighty. What's he not accept? That Baron is mighty. But a father's deeds, even had his service been rendered to me, that is, yeah, 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 your father might have earned a great name for himself. But you? I don't know you from Billy Bob. Okay, got to make the name a little bit barrier. Even had his service been rendered to me, avail not to win the daughter of Thingol and Melian. See, I too desire treasure that is with Ah, so we are going to have a, a bit of comparison of one-upping. Okay, you got a nice pretty ring there. Well, there's something I want. What? Go your way, therefore. Bring to me in your hand a silver reel from Morgoth's crown. And then, if she will, Luthien may set her hand in yours. Then you shall have my jewel. And though the fate of Arda lie within the silver reels, yet you shall hold me generous. Okay. What did his wife just tell him? Be careful. Be careful. And what does he immediately do? He makes it 
spouts off. He, you know, I was just teaching uh, Henry the Fourth, Part One, to my Shakespeare class. You know, he's like Hotspur. He just rushes in. He just jumps right in. Doesn't think what he's saying. Because in saying those words, what does he tie himself immediately to? The oath of Fanor. Anybody who comes between me and a Silmaril, me and my family and my family's family and my family's family, you know, to umpteenth generations will hunt you down until we claim that Silmaril back. Right? Thus he wrought the doom of Doriath and was ensnared within the curse of Mandos. What prompts Thingol to do that? It's a word he uses against Baron. Okay, this will get rid of him. We're good. Okay. He thinks it's an unattainable quest. Right? He thinks it's unattain an unattainable quest. Okay. But when he says, here's what I really want. I want the Selmarill. That's an act of pride. Who is worthy of a Selmarill? Anybody? Is Feanor? No. Manwe? Yes. Valinor? Yes. After all, could Feanor have made the Silmarils had it not been for the light of the two trees? No. No. And yet Feanor thinks of himself as a creator, not a sub-creator. Okay? So Thingol ties himself into the web, let's say. And we're told those that heard these words perceived that Thingol uh, would save his oath and yet send Baron to his death. For they knew not that all the power of the Noldor before the siege was broken had availed even to see from afar the shining Silmarils of Feanor. For they were set in the Iron Crown, treasured in Angband above all wealth, Balrogs were about them in countless swords. In other words, they're well guarded. <laughs> and Baron laughs. He doesn't just sit there. <laughs> uh, he laughs to Thingol's face. For little price do elven kings sell their daughters. <laughs> it's like, really? You want a cherry on top of that? You know? Because, man, that's. I'd have given you at least two Silmarils for her, you know. For gems and things made by craft. In other words, anything made by craft, according to Baron's way of thinking, it's just a bobble. B-A-U-B-L-E. Okay? It's, it's, it's really nothing. It's unimportant. What should earn a daughter's hand in Baron's mind. Great deeds. How about actions? Okay. Actions. I, but, think, I think maybe even further than that, he would have respected even more if he had pushed to kill him rather than give his daughter or to go to battle. I thought that was more likely that they would actually have to fight out. Yeah, I, I, I agree entirely. But to say here, you give me this in exchange for this? I mean, what has Thingol said about his daughter? She's the greatest thing in Arda. Oh, except for Silmaril, because <laughs> that's an even Stephen exchange. Okay? You did say even that was generous, though, in his defense. That's, oh, that's true. But if this be your will, Thingol, I will perform it. And when we meet again, my hand shall hold the Silmaril from the Iron Crown. For you have not looked upon the last, looked the last upon Baron, son of Barrier. And then he looked in the eyes of Melian, who spoke not. He bade farewell to Luthien, bowing 
He leaves. And Meline says, now you did it. <laughs> okay. O king, you have devised cunning counsel. But if my eyes have not lost their sight, it's our way of saying, told you so, it is ill for you whether Baron fail in this errand or achieve it, for you have doomed either your daughter or yourself. And now is Darius drawn within the fate of a mightier realm. In other words, and now I can't protect us anymore. Because you've now linked our fate to the fate of other places. Whereas before, we were isolated. And ain't nobody paid any attention. Melkor slash Morgoth didn't care about us. But now, like Sauron looking for the ring, he's going to be seeking. Okay? Thingol. I sell not to elves or men those whom I love and cherish above all treasure. Does he really cherish her above all treasure? No, no because he just said, bring me this treasure and she's yours. I mean, it's like the, the adage about prostitution. You know, a rich man proposes to a woman, you know, how much will it take for you to sleep with me? Hundred dollars, thousand dollars, million dollars. And if she says, oh, well, it'll be a million dollars, okay? And then he starts to bid her down. And she replies, you know, I'm not a whore. He says, you know, madam, I think we've established that. Now we're merely haggling on price. That's, I hear somebody's phone vibrating. That's yeah, it's okay. Um, I thought it was mine over here. <clears throat> um, and so, you know, he's already said he'd give her for treasure. And if there were hope or fear, that Barrett should come ever back alive to men of growth. He should not have looked again upon the light of heaven, though I had sworn it. In other words, he is saying, I don't have any hope whatsoever he'll come back. Because if I did, he would have broken his oath. He would have killed Baron before. So what's he doing? Or what does he think he's doing to Baron? <laughs> Sending him off to his death. And not breaking his oath. In other words, he's killing him by forcing Baron to commit suicide, essentially. This is the, you know, modern equivalent, equivalent of that is suicide by cop. You want to kill yourself, but you're not, quote unquote, man enough to do it. So you go and you point a gun at an officer. They'll do it for you <laughs> rather than die themselves. Okay? So Baron goes out. And he seeks help. He meets with Felagund. Okay. And Felagund knew him, we're told. He didn't need the ring to recognize him because he could recognize Bear, um, the son of Beor and Bear here in Baron's face. And Felagund, uh, excuse me, Felagund, I hate these names. <laughs> <laughs> Felagun speaks to his people, recalls the deeds of Baron's father, and then Kelagorn stands up. Okay, now when Felagun speaks the deeds of Baron's father, he's probably also alluded to what Baron's quest is. Does Felagun know about the oath? Yes. I mean, I mean Feanor's oath. But just in case he doesn't, Kelagorn stands up, son of Curufin, I believe. This is the nice thing about the names. They do alliterate, father, son, etc. on down the line. And so Kelagorn stands up. Be he friend or foe, whether demon of Morgoth, or elf, or child of men, or any other living thing in Arda, neither law, nor love, nor league of hell, nor might of the valor. It's like he's channeling St. Paul, talking about neither thrones, nor power, nor principalities, etc., Probably is where Tolkien gets it from. Nor any power of wizardry, wizardry shall defend him from the pursuing hate of Fanor's sons, if he take or find a Silmaril and keep it. For the Silmarils we alone claim until the world ends. Well, that just doesn't set things off on a good beginning. Okay. So, Felagun. Skipping a couple paragraphs. Sees that he's forsaken. 
takes from his head the crown of Nargothron, sets it on his feet, and essentially says, I'm done. Fine. You can break your oaths to me, but I must hold my bond. If there be any on whom the shadow of our curse has not yet fallen, I should find at least a few to follow me. And Edrahil comes forward and says, you're my king. And Felagun gives the crown to his brother. So Felagun and Baron set off with their ten companions. Total of twelve. And they make their way and they come to Sauron's little fortress of Enband. I say little only in relation to Utumno, Morgoth. And Felagan sings against Sauron. Whoa, this isn't very manly. I mean, they're singing. It's like a contest to see who has the better voice. Okay? But how is the world brought into being? Song. Song. So what is the power of song in Tolkien's Middle Earth? It's not necessarily magic. Okay. Old time songs are the mightier songs. What does Luthien's song do to Baron? Enchant it enchants him. Later on, fairly soon, we're going to see what does Luthien's song do to Morgoth? Enchants Puts him to sleep. Okay. So there is power in song. There is power to perform actions. Sometimes the song itself performs the action. Okay, The singing of the Ainur. And then Eru just says, look what you've sung. And they see it and it's brought into being. Okay, So we see Felagan contest his will against Sauron. But Sauron is the stronger. Why? He's a Maya. They're elves. Sauron is, to use you know, the word properly, supernatural. Because Felagan is natural. Elves are natural. They're tied to nature, the world of their birth. Sauron is not. Yes, Sauron can have a human form, or as we will see briefly, a werewolf form, or a vampire form. He's a shapeshifter, okay? But he is not the form. Which is why, in the Lord of the Rings, when the ring is destroyed, does Sauron merely drift apart? No. When Saruman is destroyed, does he merely drift apart? No. His spirit leaves. It goes somewhere, okay, but it does leave. So we have the singing contest. And Baron gets cast into the pit. And Luthien, re um, realizing that nobody's going to come help them, Luthien comes, and I'm skipping a bunch. Uh, Kelagorm, um, she comes to, but he won't help. But Huan, the hound, probably why it's Huan, um, does. And he's the greatest wolfhound in Middle Earth, we're told. And he leaves Kelagorm and comes to Luthien. Okay? And he helps Luthien. Let's see here. Again. And now the only two that are left in Sauron's uh, dungeons, let's say, are Baron and Felagan. The other ten have all died. Let's see here. In the paragraph that begins, in the pits of Sauron, Baron and Felagan lay, all their companions were now dead. Um, Felagan dies, and in the next paragraph, Luthien comes. 
and she sings. Uh, Baron sings, Luthien hears his voice, and Sauron sends a wolf, and Juan comes and kills it. Sauron sends another one, and Juan kills it, etc. And finally, Sauron takes the form of a wolf, and Juan pins him down. Okay? Sauron yields, Luthien takes the mastery of the isle. Bear, uh, bear, bear. Gotta get the names right. Baron, sorry. Uh, Baron is rescued and Felagund is buried. Okay? So what do they do? Baron and Luthien are now free. So they go and they walk off in the woods together. They're free, but they're not... How do I put this? They're free, but they're not free. That is, they're not free to be wed, for example. Okay. Because Baron hasn't fulfilled his oath. So Norgothron is overthrown and such. And Baron and Luthien get separated again, and then they come back and find each other again. And they make their way to Utumno. Um, and I actually want to pick up with the paragraph that begins. It's after this little um, song is sung, farewell sweet earth and northern sky, forever blessed here did lie, blah, 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 blah. Uh, several paragraphs after that that begins their dismay took them is that what I want yeah Luthien has made herself look like the winged fell of Thuringwethel and she's made uh, Baron look like Draugluin and we find out that Morgoth Um, chose one from among the whelps of the race of Dryobluin, fed him with his own hand upon living flat flesh, put his power upon him. Swiftly the wolf grew. And he names him Karkaroth. And he has a variety of other names. The Red Maw, and Fauglier, the Jaws of Thirst. You know. And then you could go all Princess Bride and come up with a whole bunch of you know other names if you wanted to. And he set and Fauglier before the doors of Ang to stop Huan. And Karkaroth sees them coming. Okay. And Luthien puts them to sleep. They make their way down. And they're actually able to get the Silmaril. Notice, Baron can take the Silmaril, and what does it not do? Why? It took it rightfully. He, I, that's a, about the only answer that you can have because the gods smiled upon him because Manwe said no no this one's worthy he can touch it without it burning because anybody else who tries to hold a Silmaril what will happen it burns their hands okay so how come they don't escape scot free The knife breaks or because of the werewolf? The first. It's not that the. Well, let me back up again. Yeah, a piece of the knife does break. Okay? Falls down, but when it breaks, what happens to it? It's not just that it's a cold piece of metal, it plops down onto Morgoth. It's hot. Almost like it's melting. Little Beowulfian image here. You know, when Beowulf strikes Grendel's body with the sword and he finds in Grendel's lair after he kills Grendel's mother, strikes Grendel's body, and then the sword starts to melt. Well, a piece of a shard of the sword falls on Morgoth and he awakes. Okay? Then terror fell upon Baron and Luthien. 
And they fled heedless and without disguise, desiring only to see the light once more. Now you have to understand when this happens, who is Morgoth to Baron and Luthien? And when I ask who is Morgoth, what I mean there is not relationship, but what is he in terms of power and strength and all that kind of stuff? He's a god. The biggest, worst, badass in all of creation. <laughs> Satan. Okay, not some guy with the pitchfork and the goat's tail and the little horns. Okay, but think Satan incarnate. And he's angry at you. And they kind of realize, oops. And so they're trying to get away. So Baron strides in front of Luthien. Really? Who's, who's more powerful? <laughs> By a hundredfold, Luthien's got a lot more than, ba than Beowulf, than Baron does. Okay? But Baron strides in front of her. He holds the Silmaril. Karkaroth halts. And Baron says, Here's a fire that con shall consume you and all evil things. And he thrusts the Silmaril before the eyes of the wolf. And he looked upon that holy jewel and was not daunted. The devouring spirit within him awoke to sudden fire. The devouring spirit. Okay. And gaping, he took suddenly the hand within his jaws. He bit it off at the wrist. And then swiftly all his inwards were filled with the flame of anguish and the Silmaril seared his accursed flesh. And he flees. Baron's in a swoon. Death is nigh. Luthien sucks the venom out of his hand, arm. <laughs> it's kind of disgusting when you, because what does she do? She put her whole mouth over his wrist and just starts because, you know. Okay. Hosts of Morgoth were awakened. The quest of the Silmaril was like to have ended in ruin and despair. But three mighty birds arrive. Sound like anything? The Hobbit. The Hobbit? The eagles are coming. The eagles are coming more than once. <laughs> they rescue Bilbo and the dwarves from the wards, first of all. And then they rescue, essentially, the battle of five armies when the eagles come. And then, again, at the very end of the Lord of the Rings, Frodo and Sam sitting there on the top of Mount Doom. The eagles come again. The eagles come, and they rescue Gandalf from... Uh, Isengard, uh, and then they rescue Gandalf again from the top of Mount Corinth. So, you, why are the eagles? Long way. So, what does that tell us? Is Monway, you know, the deist god just out in the universe, you know, winding his watches, <laughs> spinning them off into space? No. He's very much present, he has an eye as to what is going on in Middle-earth, okay? So they lift up Luthien and Baron from the earth. They bore them aloft in the clouds. They take them away, okay? And it's springtime again. Baron still only has one hand. It's not like Luke Skywalker. He doesn't get to go in the, you know, magical bath or whatever. Boop, have a new hand attached, okay? And finally, they make their way back to Darius. Baron the one-handed. Okay. And Luthien. But we're told, upon Darius, evil days had fallen. In other words, Thingol gets his comeuppance. Grief and silence had come upon all his people when Luthien was lost. Long they sought for her. Okay. Thing all turned to Melian. We're told in the next paragraph, but now she withheld her counsel from him. Why? Saying that the doom that he had devised must work to its appointed end and that he must wait now upon time. What does she mean? The doom that he had devised must work to its appointed end. And he said fate in motion. He tied himself to that fate. It's got to work out. Okay, keep in mind, what is Melian? 
What was Melian before she came down into Arda? She was an Ainur, but she was a lower one. But she was still an Ainur. So what did she take part in? Singing. Okay. So she saw, she sees, she knows how some of the story ends. And she says, I warned you. Now, what? She can't intervene. Because he has wound his clock and thrown it out. And now that clock must keep on ticking until it's appointed in. So do they see what they, what interaction they have, what their actions are, or just what is laid out? And not what they have to do with it. It's a good question. Because I think when they see the vision, I don't think they see themselves going down into Middle Earth. But they see, essentially, Middle Earth when it's beginning to its end. So they have to see something of their But it's not moment. each part we've revealed to them. Yeah. But the extent of that part. It's probably a, a, it's probably a good example of why Tolkien never published this. <laughs> I mean, he never finished it. It said that it gets hazy around the time that men come around. And they, they see at the end, but there's a bit of large... Trouble yeah, like because, I mean, Eru does tell them, you know, they don't know the what happens to men. Okay? And men's, man's fate is not wrapped up with the fate of Middle Earth or the fate of the world in Arda. The way... Um, other creatures are, and even elves isn't necessarily. But el even the elves' fate is somewhat determined. And only humans is completely, totally free. Okay? So I think what she is saying here is, you know, she knows some of what's going to happen, but she doesn't know it all. But she's, she's essentially saying when he turns to her for counsel, I, I gave you my counsel. Will. You didn't listen. Now you have to what? As every one of us does. you got to bear the consequences of whatever your actions are. Okay? So, Thingo learns that Luthien had journeyed far from Dariath, etc. They come back. Um, and we're told, in that dark hour, Baron and Luthien returned, hastening from the west. Okay? The news of their coming is sorrowful. And Baron comes before Thingol, leading Luthien, whom we're told Thingol had thought dead. But he loved him not. That is, Thingol loved Baron not. Because of the woes that he had brought upon Darius. Did Baron bring the woes upon Darius? Yeah, kind of. I mean, he and Luthien went to Nargothrond. Feligan left. Kind of the, the city of Nargothrond broke apart after that. Okay. And after they left Morgoth, Morgoth opened up all of his you know, hosts that are now rampaging on the northern borders of Dorath. Bad news does seem to follow Baron pretty much wherever he goes. Kind of like Gandalf Stormcrow. Yeah. But he loved him not because of the woes that he had brought upon Darius. But Baron knelt before him and said, I return according to my word. I'm come now to claim my own. You know, pardon my language here, but now I won't use that language. Gutsy move, let's say. Because Baron bows before him, says, I fulfilled my oath. Give her to me. I mean, she's right there next to him. <laughs> they've been together for however long they've been together. Uh, what of your quest and of your vow? It is fulfilled. Even now a silver hill is in my hand. Show it to me. I knew you were going to say that. Find Karkaroth. <laughs> Baron puts forth his left hand. Mm. Slowly open his fingers. Nothing there. Then he holds up his right arm. See? <laughs> No hand, okay. Then Luth, then sorry, 
Luthien's mood was softened. Then Thingol's mood was softened. And Baron sat before his throne upon the left and Luthien upon the right, and they told all the tale of the quest. In other words, when Luke went... <laughs> Luthien, and Baron, Thingol! <laughs> when Thingol sees that Baron lost his hand in the quest, his heart is softened because he sees... Baron has given something. Has he given us all? Not yet. <laughs> and they're filled with amazement. And it seemed to think all that this man was unlike all other mortal men. And among the great in Arda. What does that mean, among the great? Like me. Thingol. Like Felagun. Like Finrod. Like Finarfin. Like Galadriel. Like and the love of Luthien, a, new, uh, a thing new and strange. And he perceived that their doom might not be withstood by any power of the world. Nothing would come between them. And he's right. He's finally right. He's finally learned. Therefore, at the last, he yielded his will, and Baron took the hand of Luthien before the throne of her father. Not literally. <laughs> just... <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <clears throat> Shadow falls upon the Dor Doriath. Karkaroth comes into Doriath. They're off hunting him. And finally, you know, as they're out, Huan leaves their side. They hear a great baying. Huan kills Karkaroth. And... Baron and Karkaroth fight first. They fought to the death, but Thingol gave no heed, for he knelt by Baron, etc. Uh, Baron was bitten, uh, bit at the breast by Karkaroth. Juan then jumps him, and we're told. Juan, in that hour, slew Karkaroth, but there in the woven woods of Dryath, his own doom, long spoken, was fulfilled, and he was wounded mortally, and the venom of Morgoth entered into him. Then he came and falling beside Baron spoke for the third time with words. He bade Baron farewell before he died. Baron spoke not, laid his head upon the hand of the hound, laid his hand upon the head of the hound. Man. And so they parted. Okay. Why do you think Tolkien includes this? What's this an image of? What are dogs supposed to be? Man's best friend. And if you're a hunter, dogs are especially useful. I think this is one way that Tolkien okay, ties in to the Silmarillion part of what he says in the fairy story essay. What is one of the oldest desires? Tolkien says that. To speak with creatures unlike ourselves. And here we have had Baron speak with Juan three times. In other words, this is an old ancient desire that does get fulfilled within the context of this, this particular story. We're not going to get to Turin Turimar. But if we did, we would have something else speak there. Anybody remember what? Sword. The sword. Okay. Jump to the Lord of the Rings, and what do we see speaking? Other than the ring. If it is the ring. <laughs> Trees! Okay. Trees. We don't see rocks, unless you take Aragorn, Legolas, and Gimli jumping up from their over cloaks, you know, the writers on Rowan and such. So... Baron is aroused by the touch of the Silmaril. He holds it aloft, and he hands it to Thingol. Now is the quest achieved, and my doom full rot. And he dies. Or he at least spoke no more. How's that for a euphemism? Rather than, you know, you know somebody dies, and you don't say they died. You say, they spoke no more. Foul of poverty, you know, silence or something. 
So what happens to Barab? He hangs around, the spirit hangs around where uh, Luthien is. She's not there yet, okay, but they take him back and we're told, the starlight was quenched, darkness had fallen even upon Luthien to Nubio, thus ended the quest of the Silmaril, but the lay of Lathian, translated into our tongue, released from bondage, does not end. For the spirit of Baron, at her bidding, tarried in the halls of Mandos. How does that figure? He's not an elf. What is supposed to happen to humans when they die? They go beyond the confines of the world. Okay? And yet Baron is somehow enabled to Stick around a little bit. Well, because of Luthien's power, right? It's at her bidding. Like, well, I think all that at her bidding means is at her request. Like, mm -hmm. don't leave me. <laughs> He's also not supposed to be similar at all. Well, that's true. Also. So he tarries in the halls of Mandos, unwilling to leave the world. Now, I don't think Tolkien knew anything about, quote unquote, um, near-death experiences, but you can read all kinds of accounts, all kinds of stories of people who, quote-unquote, die. Heart stops, brainwave stops, everything stops, and they're dead for 5, 10, 30 minutes, an hour, two hours, and then suddenly they're... and they're back. Okay? And if you read some of these accounts, what some of the people will say is, I wasn't ready to go. Or something held me back. Like there was a string. Many of the accounts of people say, I wanted to go. They did see the proverbial light and you know, all that kind of stuff. They wanted to go, but somebody was holding them back. Okay? I think that's what's going on with Baron. Luthien came to say her last farewell upon the dim shores of the outer sea whence men that die set out never to return. So Baron is off here in the halls of Mandos. <coughs> Luthien takes the uh, shuttle <laughs> over to Valinor, goes to the halls of Mandos. Maybe it's just that Baron took a really long time to reach those confines. Luthien goes and she speaks to him. But the spirit of Luthien fell down into darkness, and at the last it fled, her body lay like a flower that is suddenly cut off and lies for a while unwithered on the grass. The spirit of Luthien fell down into darkness, and at last it fled, but her body lies like a flower. What image do we have here? The mother. The mother. Okay. What other image? Popular culture. Think grim. Snow White, Sleeping Beauty, okay, Cinderella, she's physically, her body is alive, why, because it looks like a flower that lays unwithered on the grass, how many flowers you know that you cut and you set it on the grass it doesn't wither, not many, then a winter, and as it were, the whore age of mortal men fell upon Thingol, but Luthien comes to the halls of Mandos. Where are the appointed places of the elves? That is, that's where the elves go when they die. Beyond the mansions of the west, upon the confines of the world. In other words, you go, it's almost like, here's Middle Earth, ocean. Over here is Valinor. And over here are the halls of Mandos. And this is the confines of the world. <laughs> so that she's kind of made her way and they're pretty close now to the confines of the world. Right? Um, uh, 
and there in the halls of Mandos, those that wait sit in the shadow of their thought. Those that wait for what? For the elves, those that are waiting to come back over here. But her beauty was more than their beauty, her sorrow deeper than their sorrows, and she knelt before Mandos and sang to him. Now, why does she kneel? Doesn't hurt. Doesn't hurt? Okay. What is she doing? She's pleading. This is a sign of supplication. This is prayer. O great and mighty Mandos. And the song of Luthien before Mandos was the song most fair that ever in words was woven. And the song was sorrowful that ever the world shall hear. So, the song was fair. It's Tolkien's word for beautiful. He doesn't use the word beautiful very often. He likes fair. Okay? So the song was fair and yet also sorrowful. Why? Other than the context, the immediate context of the story, here's why. Because the Silmarillion, the Hobbit, and the Lord of the Rings are filled throughout with an Anglo-Saxon ideology. Or an Anglo-Saxon ideology is not the best word. An Anglo-Saxon atmosphere where everything is tinged with sadness. It's, it's this notion this mentality that no matter how good things are in the world, there's always going to be a sadness to them. In other words, for every bright cloud, there's a black lining. Okay, there's always a touch. Would that go with them? For every huge catastrophe, there's a catastrophe. That's why Tolkien says there, okay. For every catastrophe, there has to be the possibility of discatastrophe. Okay? That's why he says the catastrophe really can only work in the face of much evidence to the contrary. His language. Okay? Well, what's the in the face of much evidence to the contrary? It can only bring joy. It can only suggest that there is not universal final defeat. Okay, now what does universal mean? Outside the confines of the world. Okay? It means ultimate. In the great battle of good and evil. Evil does not win. Okay, that also means that this is a battle that will have an end. It's not an eternal battle. It's, it's, Tolkien's not a dualist. He's not saying there's a God of good and a God of evil and they're always battling and sometimes the God of good gets an upper hand and sometimes the God of evil gets the upper hand and it always balances out. The force is always in harmony. That's not Tolkien's mentality at all. Tolkien's mentality is there's a God of good and then there is evil, which is merely the absence of good, the privation of good, okay? Okay. So, she sings her song, and we're told, unchanged, imperishable, it is still sung in Valinor, beyond the hearing of the world. In listening, the Valar are grieved. They sorrow at this song. For Luthien wove two themes of words, of the sorrow of the Eldar and the grief of men. Of the two kindreds that were made by Iluvatar to dwell in Arda, the kingdom of earth amid the innumerable stars. Okay. What do her two themes have to do with the original themes propounded by the Ainur? Remember, Eru gives them the, the basic score, and they start to sing, and then Melkor goes off the written score and starts adding a bunch of stuff of his own. And the Luvatar raises his hand. And that's what? That's Manwe's theme comes in. And then Iluvatar raises his hand again, and that's something else. 
He raises his hand a third time, and that's the, and he stands, and that's the children of Iluvatar. Okay, that's that great ending on that final Be Beethoven's fifth, you know, chord. And so she weaves these two themes of words, of the elves and men, of the two kindreds that were made by Iluvatar to dwell in art of the kingdom of earth amid the innumerable stars. And as she knelt before him, her tears fell upon his feet like rain upon the stones. Well, what do we all know rain eventually does to stones? It wears them down. And Mandos was moved to pity. Who never before was so moved, nor has been since. Why? Because what is Mandos' judgment supposed to be? Final. Permanent. Final. Therefore he summoned Baron, and even as Luthien had spoken in the hour of his death, they met again beyond the western sea. Another, she goes off, off to the halls of Mandos. Baron's not there. He's like right here. <laughs> on the confines. Okay. Mando summons him. Baron and Luthien meet up again. But Mando's had no power to withhold the spirits of men that were dead within the confines of the world. After their time of waiting. What is that? Waiting for what? If it's to go off to Eru Iluvatar, what are they waiting for? This is where I think Tolkien's Catholicism comes in. Purgatory. Because what is purgatory? Purging the soul. It's a purging. Okay. The doctrine of purgatory is based upon a variety of passages from both the Old and New Testament and some fathers and such, okay, where, you know, it, the various writings essentially say, you know, you will not come into my presence until the uttermost sin, darkness, spot, etc. is purged away. Okay? That's, that's my best guess as to what that line means. Nor could he change the fates of the children of Iluvatar. In other words, the fates of the children of Iluvatar is men die and leave. Elves die and can be reincarnated. Mandos can't change that. But he has leeway. <laughs> he, can, he can stretch out the time that certain things happen. So he goes to Manwe, Lord of the Valar, who governed the world under the hand of Iluvatar, Manwe sought counsel in his inmost thought where the will of Iluvatar was revealed. In other words, Manwe doesn't have a council of the gods. He turns inwards. He you know, assumes the lotus position. You know. And what is it Iluvatar wills? And he comes back out of that trance and he gives Luthien a choice. Because of her labors and her sorrow, she should be released from Mandos and go to Valimar, there to dwell until the world's end among the Valar, forgetting all griefs that her life had known. But Barry can't go there. Not permitted to the Valar to withhold death from him, which is the gift of Iluvatar to men. So that's option A for her. But the other choice was this, that she might return to Middle-earth and take with her Baron, there to dwell again. Well, is this unheard of in later times? Lazarus, come forth. He's been dead. He's been in the grave four days. He comes back out, if you take the, you know, for the purpose of the, the Gospels. What does that mean? Man, it's really got to suck when you think about it. Lazarus has to die twice. The daughter of Jairus has to die, die twice. The son of the widow of Nain has to die twice. There's several people that have to die twice. The widow's son that Elijah raises from the dead has to die twice. I mean, I guess it's okay if, you know, you hear how everybody mourned for you the first time, so you can kind of think, okay, at least people are going to miss me the second time around. But 
that line where it says where it was not permitted to the Valar to withhold debt from him? I mean, I guess I see them, if we're talking about them, it's not, they're not Yuvatar. Exactly. Right? I mean, so it's, I guess the word permitted is throwing me off. So they yeah. can't or permitted would be going against? They're not permitted by Iluvatar <laughs> to withhold debt. They can't say, sorry, you guys are all going to die, but Paul, you lived a wonderful life, you achieved the Silmaril, you don't have to die. They can't Woo. grant. They can't overthrow, overrule Iluvatar's will. There are more referees than lawmakers. Exactly. I mean, what did, what did the whole singing of the Ainu prove? No matter what you do, everything will, works together as Iluvatar says, according to his will. He's merely paraphrasing Romans 8.28. Okay, just look it up. So, she could return to Middle-earth and take Baron, and they could live there for a little while. But notice, without certitude of life or joy. So they could go back to Earth and take what comes. But if she does that, she'll become mortal and subject to a second death even as he. And when she dies then, whoop, she goes off beyond the confines of the world, never to see her kin again. She takes, she takes that one, which then opens the door for others. All of the descendants of Baron and Luthien then have that same choice. Because it's like the, the choice of Luthien gets passed down, I shouldn't use this word, but I'm going to, genetically, through them. Okay? So, who does that include? Elrond. Okay? Erendil, Elrond's father. Okay? Keep going on down. Arwen. Who will make that choice? If you've ever read the appendices to the Lord of the Rings, you find out how, how long Aragorn lives after he becomes king and all that, and he eventually dies. He's 87 when the Lord of the Rings begins. Excuse me. He's 87. He's either 87 when the Lord of the Rings opens or when Frodo meets him. I think it's when Frodo meets him. So he's old. Okay? He doesn't die for about, I think it's like another 80 or 90 years. Okay. Luthien, she becomes mortal. But that doesn't mean that because she becomes mortal, her life expectancy is immediately you know, cut short. She becomes mortal like, go back to the book of Genesis. Adam becomes mortal. <laughs> So how long does Adam live? He's like 800 years. You know, Methuselah, Adam's grandson, 969 years. Okay? And a variety of others live to be in their 900s, etc. And as time goes on, lifespans decline and decline and decline and decline until the 20th century, and they start to go back up and up and up. Okay? So, we're told, this doom she chose, forsaking the blessed realm, putting aside all claim to kingship with those that dwell there. That thus, whatever grief might lie in wait, the fates of Baron and Luthien might be joined. So it was that alone of the Eldalia, she has died indeed, left the world long ago. Alone of the Eldalia, because nobody had done that before in the world of Silmarillion. Now, again, some do after. Arwen. Arwen's the only one who takes the doom of Luthien. Is it her doom because she's not going to see her kin? Because she's taking, she's obviously gained something that was a gift to men, something that yeah. was for them. Doom doesn't have a negative connotation. Doom only means judgment. It comes from the Old English verb. She's going to miss every after that forever. Yeah, she, <laughs> which I don't know, that would be like being in the Blessed Realm, maybe. Um, no more family get-togethers, you know. Pictures, I can't, you know. Okay. <laughs> Doom comes from the Old English verb daemon, which simply means to judge. 
So this is the judgment she accepts. Okay. Now we're going to stop the Silmarillion with this, and here's why. This tale, in, in one sense, I think you could, you could say it sums up the Silmarillion. Okay? Because it has all of the major themes. What kind of book is this? Is it a novel? No. Why not? A single narrative strand. Single Do book. novels have to have single narrative strands? Anybody ever try to read James Joyce's Ulysses? Sound and the Fury. Sound and the Fury? Okay. I guess because it claims it as an account by the elves, so it's more like a collection. It's a, a god. It's a collection, okay, of tales. What kind of tales? Epic. Are are they all epic? No. Some more than others. Okay. Creation myths. Use the right word. Myths. That's what this is. Okay. Why do we have myths or myths? What purpose do they serve? To explain things that are inexplicable. To explain things that are inexplicable. Okay. What else? I mean, are, are the things that happen here inexplicable? Like or unexplainable? Okay, creation of the earth. The Downfall of Morgoth? Is that unexplainable? No, it's pretty clear, actually. But perhaps it explains something. Okay, it does explain something. Or it adds depth in richness. Okay. Tolkien says in the prologue or the foreword, which is a foreword, to The Lord of the Rings, that after The Hobbit was published, he wanted to go back to this material. Okay? And he says it was primarily linguistic in origin. And he said, so he sought out the advice of people whose advice he trusted. C.S. Lewis, Charles Williams, um, Hugo Dyson, other members of the group, group known as the Inklings, which I'll talk a little bit about uh, later as we go through the semester. And they told him, give it up. <laughs> Nobody's going to be interested. Okay? Because Tolkien says the interest in creation of this was primarily linguistic. And what he means by that is he had to give a history. He had to give stories. He had to give a culture to the languages he was creating. Because he knew language without a culture is not a language. You don't have a language unless you have a people who speak that language. The people who speak that language don't have a culture until and unless they tell stories in it. Okay? So... These are the stories told in the variety of languages that Tolkien creates. But what purpose do they serve? That is, what purpose do these stories serve? You could say they serve the same purposes that he elucidates in the essay on fairy stories of recovery. Okay. Fantasy recovery, escape consolation. It gives meaning to other stories. It gives meaning to other stories. Stories. It's where he built the world. It's where he built the realm. It's all background. This is all backstory for the Lord of the Rings. Essentially, it's all backstory for the Hobbit, which will start on Tuesday. Okay? Now, where do you see this backstory in the Hobbit? Okay, all over? Oh, the swords and sting came from Gondolin. Sting comes from Gondolin. Orchrist, Gandalf's sword, comes from Gondolin. Okay. Elrond himself. Elrond himself. The dwarves, oh. the dwarves that are mentioned. Okay, now pause there for a second. For those of you who are familiar with The Hobbit, 
Think of the elves as they are portrayed here. And then think of the elves that you see in The Hobbit. Not Lord of the Rings. Well, the, elf, the elf king was kind of obsessed with like jewels and, and treasure and that kind of ring. Of the wood elf king, you mean? Yeah, the yeah. wood elf king. Thranduil, I think his name is. Yeah, he's kind of like obsessed with gaining um, these treasures. Okay. He has a similar pride. Okay. The dwarves are full of pride over their treasures, you know. They want to get to the last lonely mountain to, or to the lonely mountain to get their family inheritance, so to speak. Okay. The ultimate likes the dwarves, and the elves didn't really like Elves and dwarves can't stand each other. Right, so you have the history as told by the elves and the history as told, told from the build up. Exactly. You've got, so you've got that antagonism from this world spilling over. But think of when Bilbo arrives at Rivendell. What kind of song do the elves sing? Tra la 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 You know, like a bunch of airhead... Or elf and elf maiden. Okay. It is nothing like the elves you see in here. They de evolve. They de evolve. Okay. Well, why? Totally different genre of story. Not totally different in the sense that one's fantasy and one isn't. No, they're both fantasy. The Hobbit is entirely. Aimed at whom? Children. Children. Who is this aimed at? Tolkien. I've, I've often wondered who it's aimed at. <laughs> it's aimed at Tolkien. Okay, he never finished this. What you have here is his sons putting together of all the Silmarillion related stories into some kind of complete whole. This is not even the form his father left it in. In fact, he adds stuff to try to make sense of some things. Now, he has since come out with some other material. You know, just uh, two or three years ago, the children of Huron. Okay. And there's only one reason why Christopher Tolkien is doing that. <laughs> he knows there are nerds like me. You know, you publish it, it has the name Tolkien on it, I'll buy it, kind of a thing. I've got it in my office. I'll bring it in on Tuesday. The 12 volume History of Middle Earth. Which they sent to me for free. 12 volume of the bastard. 12 volume <laughs> apology for the, for the Silmarillion. Yeah, I mean.